begin one of those tutorials that started out as a question, this time by our dear friend Patrick, asking how we'd pull off something like this here in this really beautiful spot for a malachy called molasses. And here we have this really viscous paint being smeared and painted around in close-ups. So after a bit of fiddling around, I decided to settle on flip to simulate those really viscous fluids being moved around. And in this tutorial, I just want to go over the basic settings I used to get the overall look kind of right. In this case, our simulation will consist broadly speaking of three elements, an emitter emitting fluid into our scene, a collider working as the brush to move this fluid around and a dot net simulating the whole setup. So let's build this step by step by dropping down a geonode in Houdini, then diving in there. And for our source, that means for our fluid emitter, I'm gonna just be lazy and use a sphere. I wanna set my sphere to be a polygonal mesh and wanna increase its rows and columns quite a bit to 48 and 96 respectively, resulting in this high res sphere here. Then I want to increase its overall scale to 2.5 and its radius along the Y axis to one. So stretch this a bit and then move this up to, I think 2.6 is what I settled on. And those values I dial in here, I figured out by just lots of trial and error. And that's the beauty of working with simulations. So patience and figuring out values, which in this case I prepared for you. Now to use this sphere as a fluid emitter, as a flip emitter, I'm going to attach a flip source, which will generate the necessary data. And in here there are two main settings which I want to dial in later and which I want to link later to my overall simulation resolution, which are the voxel size and the particle separation. However, for now, the only thing I want to dial in here is the jitter seed, so that when animating my particles are jittered and not static, just using an expression here, $FF, so the jitter seed is equal to my frame number. Also in here I want to oversample this to give a bit denser particle distribution, and I just want to slightly oversample this by 1.5 units. So far so good, just want to attach a null to this call this one out underscore source, like so. And that's it for the emitter. So when I middle mouse on this, you can see we're generating a volume called surface and a bunch of particles, which are in the point group particles. Next, let's work on that brush. And for the brush, I'm damn lazy and I'm just gonna use a box. Let's set the visibility flag on it here and rescale it a bit. So first I wanna make this a bit flatter and broader and then move this up a bit to 1.4 units. Also, I want to give this substantially more divisions so I have more polygons and more individual points to work on here. I think I settled on 160, 7, 2, and 8 divisions, resulting in this finally subdivided mesh here. The reason for me subdividing this so far is I'm going to use a mountain now to distort this box here, just not so drastically. So let's dial in those settings on the mountain node here. Let's just drag this down like this. And in here, I want to set my range values of my noise to be positive with an amplitude of one, like so. And then in my element size and my noise pattern, I want to click on the X, Y, Z vectors so to be able to dial in the element size along their respective X, Y, and Z axis independently. But I want to dial in the overall size to be 0.6 and then my individual element scales to be 0.2, 1, and 0.5 five like this. So I'm getting somewhat of this look here. Then under animation, I want to animate this noise so it moves a bit. Pulse duration of one is all right. And under fractal, I want to decrease my maximum octaves to two, making this a bit less drastic. And if I hit play now, I can see this undulating moving surface here. And that'll serve as our brush and these individual ridges here simulating individual brush hairs or fibers. Now, to use this as a collider in our simulation, I'm going to convert this to a VDB using the VDB from polygons turning this into a volumetric representation of our geometry. Again, the voxel size, I want to link later to our overall simulation resolution. For now, I just want to check fill interior and give this one more voxel of exterior band like so. And then I want to move this geometry around using a transform node. So that's where I animate my brush. And in this case, I want to start the animation at frame number 12. And I want to animate the Z translation from two units here. So let's keyframe this by alt clicking in here. And the animation should run until frame 132, where I want to have this move to minus 30 units. Again, alt click in here. Let's zoom out a bit, toggle real time here and reset this and hit play. So we can see this collider moving through our scene now. Almost done. One more thing. After the transform, I want to attach a trail stop, which I want to set to calculate the velocity of our collider here. And then finally adding a null, which we're going to call out underscore collider. So let's reset this to frame one and we are finally ready to set up the simulation using a dot net which I'll drop down in the middle here and dive in there. So in my dot net from my output upwards I'm going to use a gravity force making sure gravity pulls down our liquid. 
Then I'm going to use a merge to merge both my flip simulation with our colliders, such as a ground plane or the brush we just created. And then I'm going to use a static solver, which goes into the merge's first slot and into the static solver. I will merge again both a ground plane and then my collider by using a ground plane node, which goes into the merge first. And then a static object, which is going to be my brush collider, which we're going to set up in a minute. So this side here is just the static collisions, everything our fluid collides with. And then we need our fluid using a flip solver, which goes into the merge and the flip solver needs two things, a flip object to store the simulation data on and a volume source to source our fluid from like so. So that's our whole simulation tree. Let's start by setting up our flip object here. And the most important parameter I'm going to dial in here is the particle separation that drives the overall simulation resolution. And I mentioned that we are going to link this to a few of our other nodes. So let's do that now by right clicking in here, copying that parameter, and then going up again to the flip source where I want to link this in the voxel size. So right click in here and paste a relative reference and do the same thing for our particle separation down here. So now when I click here, I can see a linked simulation size to our voxel size and the particle separation as well. I'm going to do the same thing on the VDB from Polygon here under the voxel size here. So right click in here, paste relative reference. So now all these parameters are dependent on my particle separation, which I dialed in here in the dotnet in the flip object. Next, you can see by default, this has been filled with a default fluid. That's what I definitely don't want. So I'm going to get rid of that. And I think for now, that's all I have to dial in here. Let's go to the physical tab and in here increase the viscosity quite drastically to in my case, 2500, making sure instead of a very splashy, very liquid fluid, we get this paste like acrylic color. Finally, on the collisions, I want to dial in a bit of a volume offset here, 0.5 units to expand our volume collision detection a tiny bit. Also for now, let's increase our simulations resolution by dialing in the particle separation back to 0.05 units and have a look at our volume source to source our fluid. In here, I want to set this to source flip. I want to create a fluid and want to point this here, the sub path to the out source null that we created. And now you can see we are getting this elliptical spherical blob imported created in here. All right, onto the flip solver here. On the sub steps, I want to leave everything as is. In the particle motions tab, the only thing I want to change is the receding. And this is one of the main factors driving how fast or slow your simulation is going to be. And also how easily the paint you're smearing around will tear apart. So what I'm going to dial in here is on the one hand, I will decrease the particles per voxel size. We don't need that many particles per voxel. However, I want to drastically increase the surface oversampling to 12 and then the oversampling bandwidth to 1.5. And what that does is it makes sure that in the surface areas of our volume, so the boundaries where our volume hits the outside, there will always be lots of particles, making sure that on the one hand, our fluid surface stays smooth and doesn't show individual graininess. On the other hand, it also prevents the tearing of our smeared around paint quite a bit, but also it increases simulation times quite drastically. So be aware that by increasing this surface oversampling here, you're also increasing your simulation times. And for the final render, for example, I think I had this set to 32 or 48, which resulted in a simulation that simmed for four hours on a 16 core Threadripper processor. So be aware, this might be expensive. As far as the interpolated attributes go here, I only need the V, the velocity, and then can move on to the volume motion here. First thing I want to do is move my volume limits here around a bit. So I'm going to have my brush move from here to there and then go out of the preset bounds here. So let's fix that by moving the box center over minus 15 units. And then on the viscosity tab, let's just enable viscosity. And finally, let's go to the solver tab here and check use OpenCL, making sure that A, we are taking viscosity into account when simulating that fluid, and then also using OpenCL for the viscosity and pressure calculation, making the simulation run a tiny bit faster. Now let's set up the collisions. We don't have to do anything grand with the ground plane, but with our static object where we want to import and create our brush. I want to point the sub path to our out collider here. And let's set the view flag on this here, zoom in a bit. And in here, I want to disable the geometry display, but on the collisions tab here, I want to switch the collision guide on. So that shows me the exact collision geometry we are creating here. And I want to set the mode to use the volume sample as we created a volume here and just want to scroll down here and set our proxy volume to the out collider as well. So now we are not calculating a new volume. We are just using this colliders volume, just copying it in here and using that as our collision geometry. 
The only other thing I want to do in here is check use deforming geometry. So the animation gets imported in here. And now if we highlight our output and keep our fingers crossed and center this maybe a bit like this, maybe save this before running it. And also one level higher on the dot net here under the cache. Let's increase our caching memory a bit so we don't run out of cache and thus lose frames again. And then let's go in here again, hit save. Let's just simulate this. Let's just stop this here. And we clearly forgot one thing that is to switch off our sourcing after a few frames. So in our volume source here under the activation, you could either keyframe this or if you're lazy at like me, use an expression. So I want to check if my frames are below 12 and only then this will be active. So this will be active from frame one to frame 11. And again, let's reframe this and simulate again. So after running our sim for a few frames, we are greeted with this here, which already looks okay, looks promising. Of course, if we wanted more detail, we could always go to the flip object here and decrease the particle separation, thus increasing the overall simulation resolution at the cost of increased simulation times. Let's just try and stick with this and turn this into a volumetric surface by going up one level here, highlighting our dotnet here, setting a view flag on this, and we are greeted with these bunch of points and also this volume and this collider plane here. However, I only want to import those points from our flip simulation here. I'm going to do that on the object merge tab in the dotnet and deleting the asterisk here, just selecting the flip object one to import, leaving me with only these particles here, which I simulated. Now, one sensible thing to do would be to add a file cache here and cache this out for later. In this case, I'll just disable it. You can do that in your setup. Now we still have those cached particles. I'm going to use a particle fluid surface node, which I'll attach here, which under the hood takes a bunch of VDB operations and just merges them into this one node here that allows me to dial in all those VDB operations on one unified interface here. So the first thing again, I want to link up is the particle separation. I want to link that to my flip objects particle separation here. So again, I'm going to copy this parameter here, go back to my particle fluid surface node. And in the particle separation, I'll just paste this as a relative reference leaving me with this. Now the voxel scale takes this particle separation value, multiplies it by that factor here to generate the volumes resolution, the VDB resolution, which is the underlying volume that's going to be used to generate this fluid surface here. In my experiments, I found a higher res volume working a bit better, dial that back to 0.5 units. And also I'm going to dial back the influence scale to 1.5 here, leaving you with sometimes a bit more rougher surfaces, but also in this case, giving a bit more detail in the areas where our paint is tearing. So with the influence scale, you can drive on the one hand how smooth your surface looks. So if your surface appears wrinkly or denty, you might want to increase that. However, by doing so, you will also lose a bit of detail in those fine areas. So it's always a bit of a balance and you have to decide for yourself what values work best for you and your application. I also want to dial back the erosion scale to 0.5. And in some instances, I even used a voxel scale of 0.25, resulting in a really high res volume, which at first doesn't make much of a difference. However, when you go to filtering here, I want to enable the dilation and erosion, which makes sure that when we apply this step in between here, the filtering, the smoothing, not too much detail is lost. And this filtering, I want to set to a mean value and want to run this six iterations. So a bit more drastic. And then I want to use a final smoothing pass here, which I want to set to Gaussian, making this final smoothing pass a bit more aggressive, like so. Let's save this. And the last thing I want to do here is sometimes when you convert fluids or in general meshes into a volume and back using VDBs, you are left with discontinuities on its normals, making the reflective part of the shading quite challenging. And to address that and to fix that, let me just switch to smooth shaded here. And maybe pay attention to those specularly shaded areas here. So to address that and fix that, the old trick is using a normal normal node to generate point normals here and then using an attribute blur set to blur only the normals making sure to uncheck pin border points and in this case running something between two or four blurring iterations on the normals so before and after it's just a really subtle difference in those specular areas here however with the attribute blur enabled you are less prone to flickering in your specular areas. All right, let's attach a null to this call this one out underscore fluid and that is our flip simulation for our paint smear. So what I'd have to do now is use some render engine to shade and light this. I found it really useful to set a ground plane or a geometry, which you want to smear this onto a bit higher than your normal ground plane. So not exactly on zero, but maybe 0 0.01 units along the y axis and plus. So it intersects a bit with the liquid resulting in less shadows. 
a trick that was suggested by Chris Kopic. And also making sure that the plane you want to render this on has some sort of texture that makes the plane look a bit rougher, which makes sure the paint smearing and the physicality of this smear here tearing up looks plausible. I'm going to provide a setup for rendering this in Octane, but pretty much any rendering engine should work. Also, one last thing to mention, on this fluid surface we're going to get a velocity vector, which you should use in rendering. So make sure you add velocity motion blur and enable that in your render engine. It makes the moving parts of the liquid look way more realistic than without motion blur enabled. All right, that's it for this one. If you want to add to what we're doing here or think we missed something important, just let us know in the comments. And if you like what we're doing, want to support us or maybe you want to learn more using in-depth courses, consider becoming a patron of ours. And for everyone already supporting us, thanks so much, folks. It is through your help that Intagma is possible. With a very special thank you going out to Important Looking Pirates, Rodeo FX, Side FX, and Rafik Anadol Studio. Thanks so much, folks. And with that, as always, until next time, it is cheers and goodbye.